A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us in this edition of the 6 p.m. primetime newscast on Equinox Television, live from my headquarters in Cameroon's economic capital, Douala. I am Babla Jonathan. In our top stories in this edition of the news, a legal mind, Barista Komi and Kongi, warns of a possible eruption of another crisis in the crisis stricken southwest region's FACO division, provoked by what is known as land grabbing in that part of the country and the legal mind is calling on the Minister of State Properties, surveys and land tenure to handle the matter concerning the ancestral land of the Bakuri people with a lot of care to avoid another eruption of a crisis in the midst of a security crisis that has been pulling on for more than four years today and he made this statement, he made this statement to a Southwest correspondent Derek Jato after the National Anti-Corruption Commission invited inhabitants of over 14 sites in Boya to Yaoundé to explain how they acquired the ancestral land and out of the country one of the members of the coalition of rebel forces in the Central African Republic has died. Siddiqui Abbas is no more and in neighboring Nigeria rebels have attacked a prison setting free over 1,800 inmates. We begin this newscast in Ndu, in the northwest region of the Republic of Cameroon, despite the unstable socio-political and security climate reigning in the two English-speaking regions of the country. The people of Ndu, notably the council authorities, are saying that the reconstruction project should start in that locality. According to them, relative calm and stability has returned to the area. For me, I'm strong Sander report. The Ndu municipality, which has over the years enjoyed the position of the economic capital of the Donga Mantu Division, became a shadow of itself with the escalation of the Anglophone crisis. Economic activities, especially at the popular Ndu market, got hampered. Interdivisional and subdivisional circulation hampered with the ring road blockade in the Bui division. The Ndu council activities are a standstill until the 9th of February 2020 municipal and legislative that brought the May Abdu Kanfon Borno led team to the helm of Ndu. We have been working uh, with the funds, with the ardos, with the administration, and we have peace returning in Ndu municipality. And so for, the, for last year, we launched all our projects and uh, we received more than 8% of this project. This year we have launched all our projects and we are looking forward uh, to government for other projects. The launch and successfully received project, according to the Mayor Abdul Kanfon Borno, includes the grading of stretches within Du Town, the grading of farm to market roads and interconnection of villages in Du subdivision, the provision of pipeboard water, solar energy supply, a return to fleet circulation and a comeback of economic activities to the Ndu market. We are also ready for the ring road to begin and we think that this ring road can begin from the stretch of road from uh, Njifo in Ndu right, to Nkambe and, and beyond to Misaje because uh, we are ready. Ndu has been lagging behind as far as development is concerned and I think our people are now ready for development. We have been talking to those who took up arms and are uh, uh, in the bush we ask them to drop their weapons and many have dropped their weapons. Some are still uh, in the bush and we, we will not relent our effort in calling them to come and join us to develop our fatherland. The positive strides of the Ndu Council and Ndu Subdivision were identified and saluted by the Senior Divisional Officer for the Donga Mountain Division, Dr. Do Simon Quenty, during the Ndu Council Administrative management and stores account session at the Ndu Council Chambers. The session also saw the mayor 
Abdul Kanfon Bono receiving a vote of confidence from his core councillors for the proper management of the 2020 account. Ndu Council Municipal Authorities say their environment is safe for the government of Cameroon to commence the implementation of the presidential plan for the reconstruction and development of the northwest and southwest regions. More than 1,000 families in one of the, the two of these regions of the Republic of Cameroon, plagued by a security crisis for more than four years today, are at risk of forceful eviction. The inhabitants of over 14 sites in the southwest region of Chief Town Boya have been invited to the nation's political capital Yaoundé by the National Anti Commission and National Anti Corruption Commission mission to explain how they acquired the lands or the portions of lands they have been occupying for several years and a legal mind barrister Ekomi uh, Ngongi says so once that there is a possible eruption there could be a possible eruption of another crisis from what is today known as land grabbing in the FACO division and is calling on the Minister of State Properties Sovies and land tenure to handle the issue concerning the ancestral land of the Bakure people with a lot of care to prevent another crisis from erupting uh, from what is known as land grabbing in the FACO division. The fate of these buildings here in Boya subdivision, Simolo Big Local Modern, will be determined latest April 9, 2021 at the conference hall of the National Anti-Corruption Commission, Kunak in Yaoundé, where those claiming ownership of the structure will prove to the Anti-Corruption Commission how they acquired the land to build. They are a total of 14 sites with approximately 1,000 plus houses already planted on them. In a press release dated 19 March 2021, the chairman of Kunak, Reverend Dr. J. Denning Masigam, spelled out that all those occupying this site from Boya Station Federal Quarters, GRE, Clark's Quarters, Lower Farms, Upper Farms, Boya Fuel Plantation, Presidential Residence Land, Bostal Institute, Guest House, Wadas Barracks, Boya Regional Hospital Land, and the Government Practicing School Moliko Boya should come along with the following document. 1. Attribution Act of the Land. 2. Land Certificate. 3. Building Permit and four, receipt of the payment of a transaction through auction sales or by private treaty at the Divisional Land Revenue Collector of FACO Division. Personally, I've addressed at least 90% of my petitions to government about land grabbing in FACO. I've copied CONAC. And to barrister Eko Mengongi, CONAC has taken the right step. So if CONAC is coming in to try to correct this, they have 100% of my support and the support of the people of FACO, especially. But reminded this Cameroon Anti Corruption Commission that the land in question is not state land. There has been a mistaken impression all along, especially in FACO, that all land in FACO is state land. That is false. I can tell you that as far as 1959, the British government was paying rents to the Joint Council, Bakary Council of Victoria and Boya Council, which constituted Manga Williams and Chief Geva Shosendili, they pay rents over all the lands that were occupied by government. I'm talking about the GRE, the class quarters, the, uh, the federal quarter, I don't know if it existed then. We had uh, the, all these government station buildings. The British government used to pay rents to the traditional council on this land. Do you know why? Because it was not owned by the government. In fact, there was no Cameroon government as we know it today, before 1961. So who owned this land before then? So let us be clear, the government doesn't own land in FACO, except land that it has legally expropriated. And the process of expropriation requires the government to pay compensation to the owners of the land. The owners of the land existed here before the government of Cameroon came into, 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 into being. This legal mind also said the Cameroon government still has a window of opportunity to right the wrongs before things spill out. It's a horrible conflict in the brewing, in the making. Because it will get to a point where our young FACO boys and girls will not have a place to build their houses, they don't have a place to farm, they don't have jobs as they do not have now, and they'll be surrounded by strangers, all who are occupying these positions, who have occupied their lands through illegal processes of acquisition because they had the power. 
and there'll be a very serious conflict in the parade. I had the occasion to tell the Minister of Lands recently in Yaoundé, through the Secretary General, that if this situation is not stemmed early, we shall have a worse conflict within FACO than what is happening in the whole North and Northwest, Southwest province. April 9 is the date and Yaoundé Conference Center, the venue. The FACO sons and daughters are therefore waiting for an outcome that might change everything. Kidney failure patients take to the streets again in Cameroon's political camp de Yaoundé, protesting over poor health care delivery. This is a problem that has become a recurrent thing in the Cameroon, that hemodialysis patients are always on the streets in Yaoundé, in Douala, in Bamenda, in Betua, and other parts of the country. And they took to the streets protesting in front of the Yaoundé teaching, uh, the Yaoundé University teaching hospital. You know, as it has more. Disgruntled hemodialysis patients agitating at the premises of the Yaoundé University Teaching Hospital. They colonize, promising to remain planted here till their demands are granted. I'm a patient dialyzing in Siashu. I've been here for three years. The past two years have been hell. We have not been able to dialyze. Recently, we are on 11 days without dialysis. People buy kits for 35,000 to dialyze. Only a stone throw in General Hospital here. Yeah. There are kits, but the authorities of Seashu will not arrange so that we go and dialyze there. That's why we are out. I have been here for four years, and for two weeks, I have not undergone dialysis. My stomach keeps enlarging, and I cannot urinate. We need dialysis keys. We do not want to die. If you need a ball. The very angry protesting patients, cared less of the consequences of blocking the main road, passing in front of the Yaoundé University Teaching Hospital. Even presence of uniformed officers did not kill their determination. Any road user who dares force his way will taste the stinger of a provoked honeybee like this driver. <laughs> He beats up a woman with a chronic complication. She has not dialyzed for 19 days now. It is not the first time hemodialysis patients express their worries with regards to negligence surrounding their treatment. They say, they are fed up with barren promises and failed appointments. Nous avons tenu des réunions. We have held meetings even with the public health minister who ordered this health facility should have a three-month stock for precautionary reasons. Yet the order was not respected. The minister of finance confirms he pulls at the disposal of the hospital sufficient means to cater for us. But each time we are told Kokambo's story and obliged to pay exorbitant cost for the dialysis keys. Soyez pas, qui ne se guérit pas, mais on nous oblige à payer les keys à 35 000. Via recent meeting with the director of the Yaoundé University Teaching Hospital proved somehow hopeful. Il attend qu'on le paye. The enterprise that has to supply us keys awaits payment from government while the government says it should supply before payment. It is a repeated statement since the past three years. Worst of it all, the government had promised us 15 new machines, but it is now six months. Chief of the hospital has jailed the machines because they don't serve us in any way. We are still being treated with five old generators for all over 150 patients. For plus de 150 malades. Today, it is the Yaoundé University Teaching Hospital. Previously, it was the Bamendo and Yaoundé General Hospitals. And before then, cries of frustrations were heard in the Marwa and Ebolova hemodialysis centers. 
And another problem that has repeatedly sent inhabitants of major cities and the hinterlands in the Republic of Cameroon to the streets is inadequate portable water supply. This is a problem that is affecting almost all parts of the country where inhabitants are going for months without portable water supply. And in the city of Douala, case in point in this newscast is they pick up this neighborhood in the Douala 3 subdivision in Makulit for Way Report. At a time when 10 cholera cases and one death having registered in the economic capital Douala, access to portable water remains a veritable nightmare for locals, like it is the case here at Pekadis in the Douala 3 subdivision. The people are forced to cover several kilometers in order to fetch water from sources like wells and streams, which they qualify as doubtful, making them susceptible to waterborne diseases. We hear uh, our water here is so difficult because when sometimes when like that the water will change different colors and everything. But sometimes like that at a dry city like that the water will be shine and everything will lack of uh, drinking water here. We don't have drink water to go and carry drinking water. We have to go far somewhere. Sometimes we go guy in Geneva military there, gardens, anywhere to fresh water and we don't know. Many other families like that of Mr. Ella go extra miles by covering over 10 kilometers in order to get portable water. The situation has turned Mr. Ella into a perpetual latecomer at his workplace. There is no water in Picardus for the past three weeks. I have been driving for over 30 minutes it's looking for where I can fetch water. When I finally saw water, I had to stand on the line for an hour before I could have access. It is a difficult situation for me because my work is affected. Health experts say water is life. But when access to the precious liquid becomes difficult due to scarcity, how then is life preserved? Inhabitants of Picardis are pleading on government officials to act fast. I will plead our, our leader that he can help us to have at least in this our zone like that, uh, Picardis are desire to have drinking water. While hoping for something to be done to remedy the water crisis, Locals continue to endure the devastating impact of the water crisis. In Lum, in the Mongo Division, littoral region of the Republic of Cameroon, inhabitants are decrying the poor hygienic state of their living environments and they are attributing this to what they consider as poor implementation of the decentralization process in the country, which does not allow uh, municipal authorities to carry on with the waste disposal uh, activities in an appropriate way that will get the environment rid of huge heaps of garbage in their neighborhoods and they have been engaging themselves in some activities to remedy the situation while waiting for the administration to have the municipal authorities to do better as far as waste disposal is concerned. It is in this report compiled by Sman Chikan Gabriel. The population of Lum Chantier have been living in debt for months now. Without waiting for the council to react, the population have decided to take the bulls by the horns as they clean their neighborhood. We can't just wait for the council. That is why the youth of the Lum Chantier Quarter have decided to take on this exercise. Some of the inhabitants say if they are embarking on the exercise with their personal means is because they have patiently waited for the council to come, but that has never happened. 
Since they have the zeal to walk, they took up the task. We didn't wait for the council because we have the zeal to walk. If we have to wait for the council, we shall always be behind. On four occasions, we have confronted the council. Council officials say the council is suffering because they have no means and more to that, the so-called decentralization that the government is preaching is still in the drawers in certain offices in Yaoundé. The council has no means, reasons why the mayor in a gathering urged the different quarter heads to create development committees that will help in the development of the zones. We cry every day for effective decentralization. Notwithstanding the cleanup campaign done by the inhabitants of Lum Chantier, they are still calling on the council to come and intervene in other areas within their locality that still needs help. In news out of Cameroon, one of the members of the coalition of rebel forces in the Central African Republic, Sidiki Abbas, has died. There is still insecurity in the country, but with military aid from Russia and Rwanda, the Central African Republic seems to be moving towards an era of peace. And in neighboring Nigeria, rebels have attacked a prison, setting free about 1,000 800 prisoners. President Muhammadu Buhari has urged security and defense forces to track down the escapees. Details in this report compiled by Charles Ekome. One of the main groups in the Central African Republic, a member of the rebel coalition seeking to overthrow the regime of President Faustin Akanje Twadera, announced the death of its leader, Sidiki Abbas, from injuries sustained during an attack. In November, Sidiki Abbas, whose real name is B. Sidi Suleiman, was one of the main leaders of the armed groups in the Central African Republic. In December, Sidiki Abbas and his movement joined the CPC, Coalition of Patriots for Change and Alliance of Central African Armed Groups, that launched an offensive two weeks before the presidential elections to prevent the re election of President Twadera and overthrow his regime. Well equipped, the rebels have been at the forefront of the fighting against pro-government forces, advancing as far as 100 kilometers from the capital, Bangui. It should be recalled that since January, Central African troops, assisted by hundreds of Rwandan soldiers and Russian paramilitaries, have been conducting a counter-offensive against the CPC, which has resulted in the liberation of most of the localities occupied by the rebels. In Nigeria, more than 1,800 inmates have escaped from a prison after it was attacked by gunmen. The attackers reportedly entered the prison yard in the southeastern town of Oweri by using explosives to blast the administrative block. Police have accused the banned separatist group, the indigenous people of Biafra, of carrying out the attack, but they have reportedly denied involvement. President Muhammadu Buhari called the attack an act of terror carried out by anarchists. He has called upon security forces to capture the attackers and the escaped prisoners. And that's it for the first part of this newscast. Talking point is up next. Today we are receiving a public health expert, Professor Elvis Enobiyang Takang, is a member of the Society of uh, the Society for AIDS in Africa, member of the International AIDS Society, editor in chief of the Central African Journal of Public Health, head of Department of Health Promotion, School of Public Health of the University of Health and Allied Sciences, Ghana. Thank you for joining us today, Professor.
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Pabila, for having uh, me at your program. Ghana, and we'll be talking some health issues. And I indicated that he is the head of a Department of Health Promotion uh, of the School of Public Health and Allied Sciences of the uh, University of uh, Ghana, the University of Ghana a School of Public Health and Allied Sciences. Thank you for joining us, Professor. Thank you, Mr. Babila, for having me on your program. All right, we'll begin with uh, an incident that occurred here in your country. Some, um, I should indicate that you are a Cameroonian and you're in Ghana. Uh, now, some hemodialysis patients, kidney failure patients, took to the streets in Yaoundé. And this is something that has been happening repeatedly in Yaoundé, in Douala, in Bamenda, in Betwa. Patients taken to the streets to protest over poor health care delivery. As a public health expert, what's your analysis of this? Yeah, uh, Mr. Babila, when I saw the demonstration, I, I was moved in my spirit. I said, oh, because these patients, they see how they are dying slowly. Let me tell you something. The main focus of the government uh, with respect to health is to create the enabling environment so that the healthier choices will be the easier one for the people. But here is a case. These people, they have a health issue or health challenge and they need a dialysis in order to uh, save their lives. But now, they don't have the opportunity to do that. Now, the, the hemodialysis is like their own kidneys. They need that dialysis to make sure all the toxic waste in their system are excreted. But now, here is a situation where the toxic waste keeps accumulating in their system. And in the long run, it will damage their organs, and that will lead to death. That's why you see them demonstrating. What, why is it difficult to help these patients constantly um, in, in a kind of steady manner without uh, them taking to the streets every now and then to ask for dialysis uh, and then machines not functioning, uh, inadequate uh, or insufficient uh, dialysis kits, and so on. Yeah, uh, Mr. Bab Mr. Babila, uh, the way I'll answer your question might be a bit uh, complicated. Number one, you must understand that there are three concepts in health. There is a biomedical concept, there is a behavioral concept, and a structural concept. What you find now among the people is the first one, the biomedical. In a situation where, when you are sick, like they are having issues now, they go to the hospital for dialysis. But if I ask a question, if you look at all diseases on earth, at least 95% are due either directly or indirectly to human behavior. If you ask yourself, what is actually the cause of the kidney failure among the people? These causes can be prevented. Now, if the government focus more on primary health care and health promotion, instead of secondary care, that will need the sophisticated equipment like the hemodialysis kit, the people will not find themselves in this situation. And now, what has worsened the problem is the issue of COVID. Let me tell you, before the COVID era, you are not seeing this thing frequently. But because of COVID, COVID has brought a lot of challenges in the health system. That's why you find uh, situations like this. And sometimes we tend to blame the government because the government is not proactive. You realize that these people are coming out now very soon you will see those on the uh, antiretroviral therapy also coming out because of COVID. Everybody has shifted focus now on COVID. So this is where we find ourselves. 
Mm. Uh, how costly um, is it to acquire those uh, missions uh, and all those kids that are needed for the diocese? Oh, please, those kids are very, very expensive. We are talking about millions of dollars. They are very expensive to procure and to maintain. But if we shift our focus on prevention, we will not have this problem now. And the government will spend less on secondary care in buying high-tech equipment like the hemodialysis kit because they are expensive to procure and to maintain. All right. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, prevention. Uh, you, you indicated that um, the focus should be shifted from uh, taking care of the patients to preventing many more Cameroonians from uh, getting to that level of kidney failure. What are some of the uh, measures that government can put in place to uh, help the Cameroonians, help citizens uh, from contracting uh, diseases that will lead them to that level? And what can they do at their own level, at individual levels, to uh, help themselves, to prevent themselves from getting there? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. You know, health promotion is all about uh, enabling people to increase control over their health in order to improve their health. Now, in the situation with uh, this kidney failure, you realize that more often than not, diabetes and hypertension are the main causes. And these are diseases that can be prevented. So if we enable the people we give them the information, give them the knowledge, give them the skills on how to prevent these diseases. I think we'll go a long way to prevent the issue of uh, kidney failure. So we must educate the people on what to do to change their behavior, their dietary behavior, their lifestyles in order to prevent such diseases. If we do that, then uh, I think kidney failure will be a sort of a thing of the past. Mm. Professor, we are going to uh, end this interview abruptly because of um, poor connection. But before we go, you are in uh, Ghana and uh, you are a public health expert. What's your take about the evolution of the coronavirus pandemic uh, in your home country and the African continent at large with the issues of vaccination uh, here and there? Ghana is well ahead in terms of uh, coronavirus vaccination. Professor Elvis Eno Biang Takang, member of the Society for AIDS in Africa, member of the International AIDS Society, editor in chief of the Central African Journal of Public Health and head of Department of Health Promotion School of Public Health of the University of Health and Allied Sciences of Ghana. Thanks for joining us today. And this is where we end today's edition of the 6 p.m. newscast on Equinox Television. Equinox, why is up next?